Is it just me, or does a 100-pound wolf-like creature turning into a 360,000-pound blue whale seem a little hard to believe? Wait, you already accept that a single human cell weighing only 40 micrograms can grow into an adult weighing over 200 kilograms in just a couple decades. That's an increase in size of 10 orders of magnitude. And if animals come in different sizes at all, then there has to be one that is bigger or smaller than everything else. Even if you want to pretend, as you do, that whales are all one kind, meaning that every species of whale that ever evolved came from an original created pair, that still means that according to your own belief system, you would have to accept that the mighty blue whale is biologically related to the tiny 110-pound vaquita porpoise. So the difference in weight shouldn't be an issue at all, especially when you don't have any problem believing that snakes and donkeys can talk, that a man lived three days inside a fish in the ocean, that a golem spell can cause clay statues to come to life, that an incantation can magically revive an army of the undead, and that the sun can be stopped in the sky, despite what all that implies about the primitive savages who made up all that nonsense in the Bible. Those things you don't have a problem with. You can easily believe all manner of irrational idiocy without reason and against all reason, but somehow you just can't accept that some animals grow up big. Yeah, Jane, once again, that's your problem, not everyone else's. This is when your freedom of religion becomes your freedom to deny reality to make believe impossible absurdities instead. Who's got you covered? Oh, you got burgers. Oh, man, I love you. Yeah, well, I figured that since we're going to be studying anyways. Oh, yeah, pretty much. All right, let's see what you got here. Uh, we got the old macaroni fries. <gasps> we got some burgers. Silverware? For hey. burgers? I don't know. The girl who was giving all this stuff out was like a zombie. <laughs> so... You know what's going to be on this test, right? Yeah, whale evolution. Can you imagine what it would take for a wolf-like creature to turn into a whale? The little tail would have to turn into a gigantic fluke, and the forelimbs would have to turn into flippers. John said their little tail would turn into a fluke? That tail was bigger than you think. It wasn't a wolf's tail. It was already big enough that the animal could use it to propel its whole body while swimming. If you assume that all species of Sirenians are the same created kind, meaning that every species of Sirenian alive today evolved from the same original created pair, then you must accept that the dugong and the sea cow evolved the classic fluke shape from the relatively beaver-like flattened tail of manatees, and that evolution is the only explanation for why they still have elbows in their forelimbs and fingernails in their flippers, the last remnants of their hooves. Of course, they also have hand bones in their flippers, too, just like sea turtles do, just like mosasaurs did, just like ichthyosaurs and plesiosaurs and a few other animals did, too, because you understand how webbing can grow between toes and then envelop all the toes to make a stronger flipper. Why does this happen in every single tetrapod that has limbs and lives entirely in the sea? You can't use the common designer excuse because that does not explain why sharks don't have that structure, and neither do any of the giant fish of the ancient seas. Evolution is the only explanation for why that happens in every marine tetrapod and only in them, never anything else. I mean, there are some fish that walk on converted feet, but the structure is entirely different, like that of a repurposed hand. And if you want to pretend that every species of anglerfish are all the same created kind, meaning that they're all related to the same original created pair, then again, you still have to cite evolution as the only explanation for why only some of them have fins repurposed as feet rather than limbs specially created for that purpose. So even creationists understand how flukes and flippers evolve, and we can even see that happening in the fossil sequences of so many transitional intermediates and so many different lineages that creationists can't even admit, much less seriously consider. They would need to evolve a brand new respiratory system. I mean, that's not easy. Why would you think they'd need to evolve a brand new respiratory system? Cetaceans all have the same respiratory system we do, the same as their wolf-like ancestor had. That never changed. 
They have some modifications to that as a result of having to hold their breath so often and for so long and having to dive so deep and all of that, but it's not a brand new system. It's the same old one becoming accustomed to new demands on it. And then they would have to evolve a blowhole. <laughs> no, they already had it. Whales breathe with lungs through nostrils just like we do. It's just that their nostrils have moved from being at the end of their snouts in the earliest species and began receding in later ones, so that the nostrils move to the middle of the snout or, or more or less between the eyes in some later species, and then all the way to the top of the head in modern species, a gradual migration. Though you may not recognize it because modern toothed whales have lost the septum dividing the nostril so that all you see is a single blowhole. But if you look at baleen whales, you see that they still have two nostrils. They didn't evolve a blowhole. They just had a nose job, stretching the shape of the skull over time. That's all. And then their teeth would have to evolve into baleen. <laughs> Again, no. Teeth did not evolve into baleen. If we look to the evolution just of modern, already fully marine whales, we see transitions wherein the earliest of the baleen whales, like Lyanocetus, had distantly spaced and jagged teeth and apparently used suction rather than biting. The same as baleen whales still do. So it is in this lineage where we see that Adiocetus and Chonocetus both had small, distantly placed teeth in addition to vascular foramina in the upper jaw that is consistent with the presence of baleen in addition to their teeth implying that they were already not using their teeth anymore. So descendant species eventually lost them as their baleen grew in thicker. And that's not all. Wow, there are way too many changes that would have to be made. Including growing several hundred times bigger. <laughs> yeah, like Aunt Madge during Christmas. Well, the list of items that just scrolled past included some things we've already covered. Of the remainder, only some of them apply to the transition to become whales. Others only apply to the diversification of modern whale groups, and some of those changes aren't even real. Like when creationists imagine facial muscles or reproductive organs having to be reorganized or evolving a new blowhole. They're just misunderstanding everything again, or rather, still. Regarding the transitional stages from terrestrial walkers to obligate swimmers, remember that many of these traits are evolving at about the same time, like increasingly hydrodynamic skin being an adaptation that wasn't necessary at the onset, but would become inevitable eventually. Others of these so-called changes had already been that way since the beginning and therefore don't count as changes still needing to be made. Still others aren't quite the changes that John and Jane imagined them to be, like underwater nursing. For another example, intra-abdominal testes. In our very distant, cold-blooded ancestors, the testes were located deep inside the body, but were driven outside as the body temperature increased. And one of the ways we know this is the principle of evo-devo, where fetal development tends to reflect our evolutionary history. This is relevant to whale evolution because the fetus of a whale develops hind leg buds that are reabsorbed as the animal matures. The fetus of a baleen whale initially has teeth that are reabsorbed in similar fashion, things that wouldn't happen unless the animal had evolved that way. That's certainly not an intelligent design. As some fetal dolphins even have whiskers too, though these are usually reabsorbed within a month after birth. The only explanation is the obvious one, that their evolutionary ancestors had whiskers. There is no reason that a god would create them like that just to have that deceptive trait reabsorbed. And likewise, the human fetus has the testes in the ancient ancestral intra-abdominal position, and they descend as the fetus matures, another thing that indicates evolution. It wouldn't be like that if we were created to be this way. But there are three groups in which that development was arrested. That's Chiroptera, the order of bats, Tethetheria, a clade that includes both elephants and sirenians, and cetacea. In each of these three cases, the animal's internal body temperatures are, for different reasons, suitable for sperm production, so the testes never descend into the external scrotum. Good thing, too, because nobody wants to see that on a dolphin. The ball vertebra is a rounded vertebra at the end of the tail in Duradon, Bacillosaurus, and anything more recent than that, indicating the presence of tail flukes and the associated undulation for propulsion. And one of those cases where form follows function. 
Much of the rest of these transitions will be explained with the transitional intermediate species that we'll look at shortly, including giving birth in the breech position. Remember that this happens sometimes in land animals too, but where what is dangerous on land can be advantageous in the water, so it's easy to see how natural selection reversed that trend. The last item on John and Jane's list was decoupled esophagus and trachea. They're not exactly decoupled, but they are usually separate because the cetacean trachea usually plunges right through the esophagus. However, sometimes atavisms can occur. That's when a recent evolutionary change might reappear in a particular individual. For example, some whales have been found to have toes growing out of their hind legs, even though those legs are deep inside the body where those legs can't serve as legs anymore. Or more often, we might find a dolphin that still has hind flippers, that, just like Dorodon and Bacillosaurus had. But in this particular case, scientists happen across a dolphin that still breathes through its mouth like its ancient ancestors did. Yeah, so we're going to have to study. I mean, if we don't, this test is going to be an epic fail. Hey. You know what I'm thinking? That we're really living on a snowflake in Whoville. Pinky, are you pondering what I'm pondering? Well, I think so, Brain, but pantyhose are so uncomfortable in the summertime. No, but cramming all these facts into our heads makes me feel like we're some sort of contestants on Jeopardy. Welcome to Evolutionary Jeopardy, the game where you never know how things will turn out. Jane, pick your category. Mm, I'm going to go for whale of a tail for 500. Okay, this category focuses on different animals that supposedly evolved into modern whales. From the high school biology textbook, we see the first animal believed to begin evolving into whales. It says, Masani kids are one hypothesized link between modern whales and certain hoofed animals. Oh, what is the imagined uh, category of animals that includes sheep, camels, pigs, cows, deer, and wolves thought to be the possible ancestors of whales? That is correct! No, it's not. Not at all. First of all, wolf-like ancestors does not mean wolves, nor even canids. So we're not looking for any group that includes wolves. If we were, that group would be ferrongulata, which is not an imaginary category, but a classification that was determined both by morphology and genetics, just like these other categories are also. Now, in fairness, back in Darwin's day, when there were so few fossils yet known, he couldn't predict everything that might be revealed in the future, and his best guess back then was that whales had evolved from something like a bear, or the ancestor of bears, a large carnivore that still had a long tail, owing to whales having carnivorous teeth. But it turns out that whales are not carnivorans. When people started finding transitional whales, they turned out to have close affinity to artiodactyls. That's hooved animals like sheep, camels, pigs, cows, deer, and wolves. But not wolves. So the ancestors of whales turned out to have a curious blend of carnivore and artiodactyl traits, something that is difficult for us to even imagine, having never seen anything like that alive. A carnivorous predator with hooves? Like a literal wolf in sheep's clothing, or a sheep in wolf's clothing in this case. But then they discovered several species from the taxonomic order of mesonicids, carnivorous predators with hooves instead of claws. These emerged early in the Paleocene, immediately after the demise of dinosaurs, and they persisted through the Eocene, with the last of them dying out early in the Oligocene some 30 million years ago. Thus we had a contender for the ancestors of whales in the form of meat-eating mesonicids. They may have looked and acted like carnivorans, but they were still more closely related to sharing skeletal traits with artiodactyls. Wait, the entire evolutionary ancestry of whales is based on an imaginary creature? Yeah. That's true. No, it isn't. Mesonicids were real. One in particular, Sinonyx, was superficially wolf-like, if you can imagine wolves on hooves. Remember that hooves are just overgrown toenails enveloping the entire tip of the toe. Now for a time, mesonicids were the closest known contender for the ancestors of whales. However, since the study of evolution is science, and science is an investigation rather than a belief system, we have to test all hypotheses and follow the facts. In this case, geneticists started gathering and comparing genomes from across the animal kingdom, and they found that the closest living relative to whales was the hippopotamus. Now that doesn't mean that whales descend from hippos. That means that whales and hippos shared a more recent common ancestor than whales had with camels or pigs, which effectively eliminates mesonicids. 
Although we don't have the DNA for mesonychids, their morphology suggests that however closely related they were, they're still just outside of this grouping. Thus, the closest contender now is Indohyus, an omnivorous, long-tailed sort of hippo pig deer from 50 million years ago that is actually morphologically a lot closer and more similar to the earliest whales than was any mesonychid. Its most important feature being a thick covering of bone over the middle ear called the involucrum, which has only ever been seen in cetaceans, whales. As you'll see in a moment, this unique structure of the inner ear is diagnostic of whales. Now, if whales had been magically created, unrelated to anything else, then their DNA would not have connected them to artiodactyls the way their morphology of their fossil ancestry had already predicted. Jane? Okay, um, let's see here. Oh, I know. I'm going to go with howling for the sea for 1,000. Your biology textbook also shows a diagram of a whale evolving. It depicts the next creature in the lineup, which was discovered in the 1980s. They only discovered partial fragments of the wolf-like skull, and since they didn't have the rest of the body, they imagined that it was an intermediate between a land animal and a whale. And textbooks included illustrations of it swimming in the ocean. But then more fossils were discovered, showing it to be nothing more than a land animal. Yet it still appears in your textbook as an ancestor of the whale. Yes, Jane! Oh. <laughs> there was a fly on my buzzer. Sorry, that was not stated as a question. John. What is Pachycetus? Correct! Nothing more than a land animal, he says, ignoring all of its significance. Pachycetus was a land animal in that it was an only slightly modified into highest with hooves primarily adapted for running or formerly had been. However, Pachycetus' bones had become so dense that it wasn't suited for running anymore. Instead, it could walk along the bottom of rivers and lakes like the hippopotamus does today. Samples from the teeth of Pachycetus yield oxygen isotope ratios and variation that indicate Pachycetus really did live in freshwater environments, such as rivers and lakes, just like hippos do. And their DNA says they're closely related. It was probably also relatively hairless like hippos, and like later cetaceans, of course. That's a logical deduction, though we don't yet know for sure. There is an evolutionary principle, a natural law of evolution, that the young of two closely related species will look more alike than the adults do. Now, with that in mind, look at the skull of Pachycetus compared to the skull of a juvenile pygmy hippo. And what if we just stretched that out a bit? Hmm. Looks the same, doesn't it? The most obvious difference between this early whale and the hippo is that at some point hippos did what most artiodactyls did, reducing their tails down to little more than a fly swatter. Except that hippo tails don't swat flies. Instead, they give new meaning to the idiom about the shit hitting the fan. But the ancestors of hippos had longer tails. Epacacetus retained a very long and robust tail, which it could use for swimming, giving it a definite advantage over the hippo. But what identifies Pachycetus as a whale rather than a hippo is its inner ear. As this article explained, Pachycetus had a dense and thickened auditory bulla, which is characteristic of all cetaceans. The bulla is the bone of the skull that formed the floor of the cavity that housed the middle ear, ossicles, the malus, incus, and stapes. The thickened part of the auditory bulla was suspended from the skull, allowing it to vibrate in response to sound waves propagating through the skull. Normally, sound waves in air are reflected when they encounter a skull because of the great difference in density between bone and air. However, the density of water is much closer to that of bone. Underwater sound would have entered the skull of Pachycetus and caused this bulla to vibrate. The bulla was in turn connected to a chain of middle ear bones which transmitted the sound to the organ of hearing. Thus, the thickened bulla of Pachycetus is interpreted as specialization for hearing underwater sound. The sound passage via the external ear of Pachycetus was intact and was similar to that of other mammals, and based on this, Pachycetus retained the ability to hear airborne sound. The eyes of Pachycetus face to the side and slightly upward. This, in combination with its inferred diet based on a nasty set of teeth and its inferred ability to walk on the bottom, suggests that it attacked its prey from below. Yet, despite all of this, the dishonest host of this idiotic Jeopardy parody wants to pretend that Pachycetus was nothing more than a land animal. 
That's not right. Pachycetus was evidently significantly more than that. That's why it belongs in our textbooks. Your pig, John. Same category. It's time for the Daily Double. If you answer this right, John, you'll get double the amount. There are only two fossils ever found of this next creature on your chart. In your biology textbook, it says, the limb structure of this creature called walking whale suggests that these animals could both swim in shallow water and walk on land. However, it appears to be nothing more than a land animal. In other words, it was defined as a walking whale. Not because it had a whale's tail or flippers or a blowhole, but simply because they believed it to be. In fact, they didn't even find the part of the skull that would have a blowhole. But they still add a blowhole in museum drawings. And since it was a land animal with four legs, it was then called a walking whale. What is Ambulocetus? You are correct! Well, you did just show him the answer. Twice. Wow, that's some serious circular reasoning. And no, it's not circular reasoning. Instead, you've bought into a pack of lies. Now, first of all, I've seen many images of Ambulocetus, and I've never seen one that included a blowhole. Just their nostrils, which is what the blowhole is. Except that it's out in their snout, so no one should have been confused by that. Then, the thing that identified Ambulocetus as a walking whale was not that people believed that it was, but the reason they believed that it was is that it meets the criteria. And just as Pachycetus is a more aquatic adaptation of Indohyus, Ambulocetus was chronologically the next generation and the next level of adaptation from Pachycetus, following the exact same form with slightly more marine mods. And although the inner ear of Pachycetus was already enough to identify it with cetaceans, the inner ear of Ambulocetus was even more so, having at least one of the peritympanic sinuses indicative of cetacean ears. But it doesn't stop there. Artist impressions are rarely accurate, but as you can see in this photo of this fossil, Ambulocetus had short legs, very short, like a crocodile. So short that walking around on land would have been just as awkward as a crocodile walking around on land, or an otter walking around on land. Ambulocetus also had flattened tail vertebrae, like an otter, implying that it used its tail for propulsion in the water, and therefore probably had flattened skin around the tail, like a beaver has. That certainly aligns with the shape of the spine. Thus, its morphology implies that it filled a crocodile-like niche, and the fossils were found in what were originally coastal or marine environments, just like you'd expect of a semi-marine transition. Then, according to stable isotope analysis, Ambulocetus was a primarily freshwater animal that could also hunt in salt water, but needed fresh water to drink, thus demonstrating yet another of the evolutionary transitions that John and Jane talked about earlier. But of course, the willfully ignorant, dishonest Jeopardy host ignores all of this to pretend that Ambulocetus was nothing more than a land animal. Because his belief system doesn't allow him to admit or even consider the truth. So all he can do is lie about it. John. Uh, I'll go with Whale the Tail for 3,000. This creature is often depicted in museum and textbooks with a tail fluke. However, they never found the fossil bones for their tail. Also, this creature was often portrayed with front flippers until they found fossils to show it actually had front legs. What is Rhodocetus? Correct! Oh, yeah. Hey! I think this is my thought bubble. Who cares? Notice how the limb flippers of Rhodocetus are depicted as being very similar to Myocetus before it and Dorodon after it. This is the way they are typically represented, as having limbs adapted for swimming that might still be usable for walking to, at least along the bottom where the water could support their weight. That's Rhodocetus in the background. But if you get to Remington Acetus in the foreground, that's the halfway point from no longer being able to walk ever again. Moving on, this creature seems to be nothing more than an extinct sea creature. What appears to be leftover legs from evolution actually turns out to be claspers used during mating season. This is true in many current species of whales. What is Basilosaurus? Yes! (laughs) 
except that current species of whales don't have these claspers because those really were the last vestiges of hind legs that now only occur as atavisms. Those aren't claspers, those are legs. Modern whales don't have them anymore. Bacillosaurus was misnamed by someone who initially thought that it was a reptile. Really, it should be called Zogalodon since it is a mammal. It was an early whale. But the scientific community favors priority. Whoever named it first, that's the name that usually sticks. Last one. This creature appears to be nothing more than an extinct whale. John, what is Duradon? Excellent! Nothing more than or different than another primitive species of whale, just like Bacillosaurus, one that still has hind legs complete with feet and toes. But believers can't talk about that or even admit it. They have to pretend as if those limbs and toes are not what they are. They have to pretend as if modern whales have this feature too. They don't, and the faithful know that they don't, but they still got to make believe that they do in defense of the faith. And the last two remaining names, Mestacetes and Odontocetes, are just modern whales baleen, and tooth whales, respectively. You've left out an awful lot, because it wasn't just Ambulocetus and Rhodocetus leading to Bacillosaurus and continuing on to the division of baleen and toothed whales. There was also Cuchocetus, one of several different species of Remington acetids known so far. And most of the early whale evolution occurred in or around the Tethys Sea, which used to be between Africa and the Near East, of course, dried up now. But Paragocetus fossils have been found as far away as the Pacific coast of Peru, implying that they were long-distance seafarers. Their caudal vertebrae was flattened, implying a beaver-like tail for swimming. Not yet fluked, perhaps, but getting close. Interestingly, though, Paragocetus also had webbed feet instead of flippers, and the tips of their toes even had hooves, revealing their biological relationship to artiodactyls. 40 million years ago, just 10 million years into the cetacean evolution, there were also Eocetus, Babiocetus, and Georgiocetus, who, like Rhodocetus, had a pelvis that was just barely connected to the spine, becoming detached, so that even if they had back legs, they'd be too weak to walk on dry land, such that the best that they could do was wallow like a walrus. And finally, it's worth mentioning Protocetus from over 40 million years ago. Like so many of these others, it seems to have had back legs and webbed feet, but it also had skeletal evidence of tail flukes, something that creationists insist that these animals cannot have, because a four-legged whale with a fluked tail makes their evolution from land animals too obvious to deny, unless your faith is so unreasonable that you must deny any truth. Well, John, it looks like you've won! You've won a grand prize. It's a... New car? No, a cold hamburger. <laughs> what? A cold uh, hamburger? Cold hamburger, John. A cold hamburger. Hamburger, John. John. Hello? John? Your burger's getting cold. What's up with the silverware? Your perfectionism kicking in again? <laughs> no. No, these are arranged in an evolutionary story. See, we start with a knife that eventually evolves a round end to become a spoon. And then over time, some notches form into it and it becomes a spork and eventually a fork. I believe a spork may actually be a transitional fossil. It's just not right. I know what you mean. You can't spear a salad and soup just drizzles, drizzles through. through. John and Jane don't have a clever script writer. Whoever cobbles their lines together copies every argument from the anti-science excuses of other religious apologists. So I have to wonder, what idiot did they copy this ridiculous argument from? I've been doing a lot of research on the evolution of the fork. I've pieced together fragmentary evidence for a long time. I believe, after studying this very intently, that the knife evolved first. Slowly, over millions of years, great geological pressures squeezed it. <coughs> and made it concave on one side, convex on the other, and squeezed it into a spoon. And then slowly, erosion cut grooves into the end and turned it into a fork. I knew I was onto something here, but I felt like I had a missing link, particularly between the spoon and the fork. I just couldn't find it. Till one day I was flying to Connecticut on U.S. air. I was 30,000 feet off the ground, and the stewardess walked down the aisle and just handed me the missing link. I don't think she knew what she had. But my trained scientific eye picked it up right away. I said, wow, this is it. I've got it. 
I stuck it in my pocket. Later that day, I went to Popeye's Chicken and found another one. <laughs> there they are, folks, the missing links. Imagine being so dim, so bereft, that not only would you repeat such embarrassingly infantile nonsense as this, but that you'd steal it from a convicted fraud. Who's the more foolish, the fool or the fool who follows him? Well, anyway, I think your problem is that each of these utensils is designed for a very specific purpose. I think your problem might be the arrogant, condescending prick who is always passive-aggressively criticizing her, gaslighting her, and mansplaining. Exactly, and just like the royal chart, each of these animals were created by God to be exactly what it is. Then your God is either incompetent or cruel because that would mean that your God created some of these transitional whales crippled with hind legs that were too small or too weak or that had limited use for swimming but they couldn't walk at all because their pelvises weren't connected to the spine anymore. If John and Jane are right, then that means that it was God's plan that modern sperm whales only have teeth in their bottom jaws, but their monstrous ancestors like Leviathan Melvii from nine or 10 million years ago still had teeth along the top and bottom. You want to believe that your God took the top teeth away and that thought that was an intelligent design? If that was the case, then why did he give those teeth to Leviathan? Why did he change his mind? Why would God create whales with both teeth and baleen when having baleen meant that they couldn't use their teeth anymore? Why did God create Otobeta sit-ups, the neogene whale with asymmetrical tusks, cousin of the narwhal, also known for its asymmetrical tusks? Are these two biologically related through a common ancestor? Or did God make two such remarkably similar mistakes in the same taxonomic family just to make it look like they're related? Why would God make a whale with hooves, or a manatee with hooves for that matter, and not just one either, but several of them in what appears to be a fluid chronological succession. You want us to believe that your God created all of this stratigraphic evidence of evolutionary generations for which many different isotopes provide absolute and reliable radiometric ages, and that God did all this knowing the only way we could interpret that. Why would he do that? Is your God trying to fool us all? In Genesis 1.21 says, so God created great sea creatures and every living thing that moves, with which the waters abounded according to their kind, and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. So when you line up a theoretical ancestor, those were real animals, not theoretical. A couple of extinct land animals, not exactly land animals, but aquatic intermediates between terrestrial and marine. An extinct sea creature, also known as a very primitive whale. An extinct whale. Just as primitive as the other one, and practically identical to it apart from the size. So why do creationists identify Dorodon as a whale and say that Bacillosaurus is something else? The hell's the difference? And a couple of modern whales. Not a couple whales, a couple different orders of whales, amounting to more than 90 species collectively just among those that are known today, with numerous others that are only known from the fossil record, which creationists are unable to either admit or dismiss. So you can tell a pretty good story about how a 100-pound wolf-like creature turned into a 360,000-pound blue whale, but don't make it true. Likewise, with absolutely no concordant or supportive facts whatsoever, you can tell a whale of a tale about a man living three days inside a whale, or about a magic invisible genie poofing whales out of thin air with an incantation of abracadabra. But that don't make it true. You need evidence to show that something is true. And you ain't got any that isn't against you. Lying about the evidence for evolution doesn't make it not true. And the evidence that John and Jane lied about in this episode is what shows evolution to be true. True. Sure. Kind of makes you think, doesn't it? It makes me think that believers know they're full of shit but that they just don't care what the truth is, and they want to believe anything but the truth. So they will tell any lie necessary to make believe something else instead.